This is Rob Kilmer. The use of fear in American politics. That's what we're talking about this week on You Defend It. I want to welcome you to You Defend It for August 29, 2009. This show is pre-recorded, so there will be no uh, no phone calls today. I am uh, I will be out of town when this show airs, and I am not responsible for uh, any earth-shattering events that occur between now, which is Wednesday when I record this, and Saturday when this is heard. It's not that I've uh, opted not to cover the most important thing that's ever happened. I just recorded the show in advance. But welcome to You Defend It. My website is www.youdefendit.com. That's Y-O-U, defendit.com. You can give me your comments on the show anytime. By Friday of each week, I will have the topic up for the next show. You can also visit my blog through the site. You can read my posts and leave your own. You can always listen to my show live on streaming audio on www.wmbf.com. My show is then uploaded to youdefendit.com later on Saturdays, and you can listen to it from there if you missed it live. Finally, there is a new debate suggestions section. It is at the top of the homepage. Leave me your thoughts on topics, debaters, and questions. Okay. This week we're going to be talking about, uh, or continuing to talk about, the use of fear in American politics. But first things first, I owe an apology to Jim from Port Crane. Jim was the last caller last week, and I believe it was the first time he has called my show. And he made a good point on the show about uh, private insurance companies being just as ruthless in their decision-making regarding your care as uh, this government-run health care is alleged to be, or that this government-run health care will be if it ever comes into being. I'll get into that more in a minute. But uh, Jim made his point by using the word kill a number of times, and when he signed off by saying peace, it caught me off guard. I basically laughed my way to the end of the show, and uh, that is not in keeping with my promise to treat every caller with complete respect. I did not do that for Jim for, from Port Crane, and I apologize, Jim, if you're listening. I hope you call again. Um, it was uh, my lapse. Okay. After the show last week, um, the next day, Sunday, I was reading a column by Frank Rich in the New York Times. Now, there's, I will tell you up front, just as I have read... Uh, and played clips from uh, people who would be considered conservative. In fact, I think one of the two two articles I've referred people to that I posted links to on my uh, website is from a conservative on the uh, gas drilling issue. But Frank Rich is he's liberal, and I read this and I thought to myself, this is accurate. And I, while I certainly uh, endeavor to be fair on this show, that doesn't mean that I disagree with what the left says or the right says, and I try and find some middle ground. Sometimes one side or the other has it exactly right, and in my view, Frank Rich did. So I'm going to read to you from his article um, last in last Sunday's New York Times. Quote, It is time to water the tree of liberty, End quote. Said the sign carried by a gun-toting protester milling outside President Obama's town hall meeting in New Hampshire two weeks ago. The Thomas Jefferson quote that inspired this message, of course, said nothing about water. Quote, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. End quote. That's the beauty of a gun. You don't have to spell out the blood. The protester was a nut. America has never had a shortage of them. But what's Tom Coburn's excuse? Coburn is a Republican senator from Oklahoma where 168 people were murdered by right-wing psychopaths who bombed a federal building in Oklahoma City in 1995. Their leader, Timothy McVeigh, had the Jefferson quote on his T-shirt when he committed this act of mass murder. Yet last Sunday, when asked by David Gregory on Meet the Press if he was troubled by current threats of violence against the government, Coburn blamed not the nuts, but the government. 
Well, he said, I'm troubled, at it. I'm troubled any time when we stop having confidence in our government, the senator said, but we've earned it. Coburn is nothing if not consistent. In the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing, he was part of a House contingent that helped delay and soften an anti-terrorism bill. This cohort even tried to strip out a provision blocking domestic funding, domestic fundraising by foreign terrorist organizations like Hamas. Why? The far right, in league with the National Rifle Association, was angry at the federal government for aggressively policing America's self-appointed militias. In a 1996 floor speech, Coburn conceded that terrorism obviously poses a serious threat, but then went on to explain that the nation had worse threats to worry about. There is a far greater fear that is present in this country, and that is fear of our own government. As his remarks on Meet the Press last week demonstrated, the subsequent intervention of September 11th has not changed his worldview. I have been writing about the simmering undertone of violence in our, pilot, in our politics since October, when Sarah Palin, the vice presidential candidate of a major political party, said nothing to condemn Obama haters shrieking treason, terrorist, and off with his head at her rallies. As vacation beckons, I'd like to drop the subject, but the atmosphere keeps getting darker. Coburn's implicit rationalization of, for far-right fanatics bearing arms at presidential events, the government makes them do it, cannot stand. He's not a radio or Fox News bloviator paid a fortune to be outrageous. He's a card-carrying member of the United States Senate. On Monday, the day after he gave a pass to those threatening violence, a dozen provocateurs with guns, at least two of them bearing assault weapons, showed up for Obama's VFW speech in Phoenix. Within hours, another member of Congress, Phil Gingray of Georgia, was telling Chris Matthews on MSNBC that as long as brandishing guns is legal, he, too, saw no reason to discourage Americans from showing up armed at public meetings. In April, the Department of Homeland Security issued a report, originally commissioned by the Bush administration, on the rising threat of violent right-wing extremism. It was ridiculed by conservatives, including the Republican chairman, Michael Steele, who called it the height of insult. Since then, a neo-Nazi who subscribed to the anti-Obama birther movement has murdered a guard at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, and an anti-abortion zealot was gunned down. An anti-abortion zealot has gunned down a doctor in a church in Wichita, Kansas. This month, the Southern Poverty, Poverty Law Center, the same organization that warned of the alarming rise in extremist groups before the Oklahoma City bombing, issued its own report. A federal law enforcement agent told the center that he hadn't seen growth this steep among such groups in 10 to 12 years. All that's lacking is a spark, he said. The uptick in the radical right predates the health care debate that is supposedly inspiring all the gun waving. Nor can this movement be attributed to a stepped-up attack by Democrats on this crowd's holy Second Amendment. Since taking office, Obama has disappointed gun control advocates, by relegating his campaign pledge to reinstate the ban on assault weapons to the down low. No, the biggest contributor to this resurgence of radicalism remains panic in some precincts about a new era of cultural and demographic change. As the sociologist Daniel Bell put it, what the right as a whole fears is the erosion of its own social position, the collapse of its power, the increasing incomprehensibility incomprehensibility of a world, now overwhelmingly technical and complex, that has changed so drastically within a lifetime. Bell's analysis, however, appeared in his essay, The Dispossessed, published in 1962, between John Kennedy's election and assassination. JFK, no more a leftist than Obama, was the first Roman Catholic in the White House and the tribune of a new liberal order. Bell could have also written his diagnosis in 1992 between Bill Clinton's election and the Oklahoma City bombing. Clinton, like Kennedy and Obama, brought liberals back into power after a conservative reign and represented a generational turnover that stoked the fears of the dispossessed. While Bell's essay remains relevant in 2009, he could not have imagined in 1962 that major politicians, from a vice presidential candidate down, would either enable or endorse a radical and armed fringe nor could he have imagined that so many conservative intellectuals would remain silent. William F. Buckley did make an effort to distance National Review from the John Birch Society. 
The only major conservative writer to repeatedly and forthrightly take on the radical right this year is David Frum. He ended a recent column for the week titled The Reckless Right Courts Violence with a plea that the president be met and bested on the field of reason, not with guns. Those on the right who defend the reckless radicals inevitably argue that the left does it too. It's certainly true that both the left and the right traffic in bogus, Holocaust-trivializing Hitler analogies, and yes, the protesters of the anti-war group Code Pink have disrupted congressional hearings. But this is a false equivalence. Code Pink doesn't show up on Capitol Hill with firearms. In the 1960s, historian Rick Perlstein pointed out on the Washington Post website this week, not a single Democrat politician endorsed the weathermen in the Vietnam era. This week, the journalist Ronald Kessler's new behind-the-scenes account of presidential security in the President's Secret Service rose to number three on the Times nonfiction bestseller list. No wonder there's a lot of interest in the subject. We have no reason to believe that those hugely dedicated agents will fail us this time, even as threats against Obama, according to Kessler, are up 400% from those against his White House predecessor. But as we learned in Oklahoma City 14 years ago, or at the well-protected Holocaust Museum just over two months ago, this kind of irrational radicalism has a myriad of targets, and it is impervious to reason. Much as Coburn fought anti-terrorism bill after the carnage of Oklahoma City, so three men from Baghdad, Arizona, drove 2,500 miles in 1964 to testify against a bill tightening federal controls on firearms after the Kennedy Association assassination. As the historian Richard Hofstetter wrote in his own famous Kennedy-era essay, The Paranoid Style in American Politics, those Arizona gun enthusiasts were convinced that the American government was being taken over by a subversive power. Does that sound familiar? The GOP, whose ranks have now dwindled largely to whites in Dixie and the less populated West, is not even a paper tiger, it's a paper muskrat. James Carville is correct when he says that if Republicans actually carried out their filibuster threats on health care, it would be a political bonanza for the Democrats. In last year's campaign debates, Obama liked to cite his unlikely Senate friendship with Tom Coburn, of all people, as proof that he could work with adversaries. If the president insists that enemies like this are his friends and that nuts they represent can be placated by reason, he will waste his opportunity to effect real change and have no one to blame but himself. I realize that was a, for me, that was a long article to read, but I thought it was worth reading. Uh, we had been talking the day before about the role of fear and fear mongering among our politicians and what a cheap shot I think it is. And I thought that was uh, an extremely poignant piece written by him. I wish I'd seen it before my show last week. Okay, we're going to take a break and come back and talk about uh, this and fear-mongering in general in our politics. We will be right back. You are listening to You Defend It with Rob Kilmer right here on News Radio 1290 WNBF Binghamton. Put Welcome back to You Defend It with Rob Kilmer. This show was pre-recorded, so there will be no, no call-ins. During the first segment of the show, I read to you from an article, or from an opinion piece, written by Frank Rich in the New York Times last Sunday. And in it, he talks about uh, Senator Tom Coburn, a Republican senator, essentially, if not endorsing, at least explaining uh, the rationale behind people carrying weapons at at uh, presidential town hall meetings. You know, when he says that I'm troubled at any time, I'm troubled any time when we stop having confidence in our government, but we've earned it. You've earned what? And by the way, you're not present at these things, Senator 
Coburn. This is where the president is present. And when we're talking about this in the context of people carrying assault rifles outside of events where the president speaks, what is it that the president has earned? Getting shot? It, it, is, it is amazing. And what's even more amazing is that I didn't hear about this on the news. I saw it in the middle of an article written by Frank Rich. I don't think we need to inflame the American public on an issue like health care, particularly when the issue itself, as it's being discussed right now, most of it is an illusion. Most of the arguments, most of the issues that people are upset about aren't issues at all. They're not even real. Things like death panels. It's not real. Nobody's suggesting that. Nobody ever has. And yet you've got people so angry that they are screaming down their elected representatives at uh, town hall meetings. So, to me, it begs the question, what is it you're bringing to the table? And the answer is fear. And fear is an amazing thing. Fear can make rational people irrational. I invite you, by the way, to call me next week, uh, first week in uh, September. I think it'll be September 5th, the, the next time I do the show live. Or email me with your examples of the left doing this. I think the left can be gutless sometimes. Take, for instance, the stimulus package, even health care reform. Whether they're right or wrong, they don't even fight for what they believe in. But they don't seem to be advocating killing people. And when you look at a person carrying an assault rifle to a, to a presidential uh, event and say, we've earned it, what is it that you've earned? I'm trying to understand that, and i got to tell you that I don't. Earned what? I mean, assault rifles do not have a... a a broad spectrum of uses. It's pretty narrow what you what you do with an assault rifle, in my experience. And I've shot them. It is an amazing thing that we have a United States Senator essentially saying that the government is at fault here. Now these are the same people ordinarily who refer to anybody who criticizes the United States as the blame America first crowd. Well, where, is, where are the people who are, who are so sensitive to that, to blaming America first? Where are those people? Why haven't they risen up and said, wait a minute, Senator, come on. Don't blame the government. For health care. I mean, you don't want government in health care. And the, the fact that we're even debating it right now is, is cause to kill members of the United States government? I want you to think about this. I want you to think about fear. Years ago, I was in Buffalo, and they have a war memorial there. And on the memorial is the following, which was written by a man named George L. Skypeck, and it's entitled Soldier. I was that which others did not want to be. I went where others feared to go. 
I did what others failed to do. I asked nothing from those who gave nothing and reluctantly accepted the thought of eternal loneliness should I fail. I have seen the face of terror, felt the stinging cold of fear, and enjoyed the sweet taste of a moment's love. I have cried, pained, and hoped. But most of all, I have lived times others would say were best forgotten. At least some day, I will be able to say that I was proud of what I was, a soldier. I have remembered it since the day I read it, and the line that it, the reason I remember it is because of that line felt the stinging cold of fear. That's what real fear is. That's what real fear does. Why do we as a nation tolerate any of it in our public discussion of national issues? Why do we tolerate it? It has no place. It has no place in a legitimate discussion of health care reform. Fear of what? Fear that the government's going to take it over? We're going to take another break uh, for local news and be back right after that. You are listening to You Defend It right here on News Radio 1290 WNBF Binghamton. Welcome back to You Defend It with Rob Kilmer. This show was pre recorded. As I am uh, out of town, as you hear this, I will will be back next week on the, I guess, I guess it would be September 5th. Okay, we left off talking about uh, about fear, and I want to repeat that I, I invite you to call me uh, when I come back on the 5th or email me with examples of, of the left, if you have them, doing what, uh, what I think Frank Rich has rightfully accused Senator Tom Colburn of doing, which is uh, Republican Senator Tom Colburn, of at least endorsing uh, people bringing weapons, in one case an assault rifle, to, uh, to an event where the president was speaking. Now, first of all, I don't know how that person doesn't just get shot on sight by the Secret Service. I don't know. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but I'm... They tend to be pretty vigilant about that. But the fact remains, uh, people are showing up armed at these meetings, and for what, they don't claim to be there in case they get mugged on the way home. They don't claim to have the weapon for that reason. They, they're mad at their government. I mean, when the issue is narrow like that, I say you've got to stand up and condemn it. Nobody's talking about your right to, to own a weapon. But when you specifically say that you have brought a weapon somewhere because you are mad at your government and your senator turns around and says, and we've earned it, we've reached a new low. That is an embarrassment. That is a tacit acknowledgement that you are unable to discuss issues rationally. I want you to think about the last time you were truly scared. I mean really scared, paralyzed scared, making promises scared, making deals with God scared. So scared that your heart pounds when you're standing still. Now think about the person who made it all go away. Everybody has had this experience at some point in their life. Think about that person who made it go away. How did you feel about that person?
That's the steady hand in your life. Why aren't we talking about that? Why is in our public discourse a search for that? Cable has created an environment, a climate, where we are drawn to fear. In fact, we are drawn to fear mongers. We are drawn to people who create, promote, and become wealthy off of fear. We don't even know what to look for anymore. We should be looking for someone to lead us. We should be looking for our elected representatives. We should be looking for the people who most remind us of the people who took our fear away. Those are the people who bring something meaningful to your life. Those are the people who should be making decisions. It's always easier to create a, to create a problem than it is to solve one. But we don't look for that. Not now. We have the Obermans. We have the O'Reillys. We have the Hannity's. We have Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck. He called the president a racist. He said that he hates white people. Deep-seated hatred for white people. Thank God his advertisers are leaving him in droves. It's the only thing that seems to work. It's not like he's offended anyone's sense of morality at Fox. And I'm not saying there, are peop there aren't people at Fox with a sense of morality. I'm saying that it is amazing that somebody could make that statement and still be on the air. He has every right to say what he says, and they have every right to fire him. And the fact that that's condoned... But he gets 2.4 million viewers a day. To my knowledge, well, he cleans up on his time slot. I don't know how he does overall. Uh, but what does that tell you? Now, getting the most people to watch you doesn't make you any good. It's a reflection of the times we're in. And 2.4 million people is about three-quarters of 1% of America. In and of itself, the number is meaningless. But when you think that he is number one in his time slot, saying things like that, it, it, it's legitimate to ask what kind of country we have become. You know what I thought was... I think the best line in the entire article by uh, Frank Rich was a line that wasn't even his. In his article, he says, The only major conservative writer to repeatedly and forthrightly take on the radical right this year is David Frum. He ended a recent column for the week titled The Reckless Right Courts Violence with a plea that the president be met and bested on the field of reason, not with guns. Where are you going to go to find the field of reason? Where are you going to see the president met and bested? What field? I say that field doesn't exist yet, but I'm working on it. While I'm away, 
I'm going to be trying like crazy to get a hold of Frank Rich. And I've tried to get a hold of people on the right. Um, I'm hoping to have a meeting while I'm away. I was somebody who can, uh, I hope, advance uh, the You Defend It debates. But make no mistake, as this country becomes less and less a superpower, and I don't, I'm not just talking in terms of arms, China has surged far ahead of us in the area of solar energy. Obama was right last year when he campaigned. This, the energy crisis should be the turning point for the American economy. We should lead the world in renewable resources. You can create a, an economy doing that. We're not. We're not doing that. And we could be. Because of fears of American jobs being lost. I've talked on this show a number of times about how counterproductive it is for us to be buying oil from countries that don't particularly like us. And yet, it turns into a uh, drill here, drill now, do what's best for America. Forgetting for the moment the fact that there, as I've argued previously, any drop of oil that is drilled from American soil can go anywhere in the world. We don't know who owns it. Whoever owns the lease decides where it goes. We haven't nationalized the oil industry. And that's just the type of argument we get, some emotional pull about saving America, drill here, drill now, be American, you know, buy American. It's all, isn't that kind of anti-American? Isn't America about capitalism? Isn't the essence of capitalism that the best wins? You should buy the best, whatever it is. That's capitalism. If you're going to buy American, that's protectionism. But this health care debate that we are told has, you know, awakened the sleeping dragon out there in the public. It has not. There, nobody knows what health care reform is even being discussed. I have yet to see an intelligent discussion or hear an intelligent discussion on the radio. I've yet to see one on television about health care reform and what is actually being contemplated. I do hear a lot about socialized medicine, and we'll get back to that in a minute when we come back from a break. But I think fear in this country has reached a new level, and it's such a commodity in the advent of the cable era that I don't see it going away anytime soon unless we do something about it. We'll be right back. You're listening to You Defend, you Defend It on News Radio 1290, WMBF, Binghamton. Welcome back to You Defend It with Rob Kilmer. Uh, this show was pre recorded, so there are no, uh, no calls today. Okay, we left off talking about uh, socialized medicine. And I made this point somewhat uh, during, my, during our recent discussion of it, but I, I want to make it again. Medicare and Medicaid are socialized medicine. I would like people to call in when I get back on uh, September 5th and tell me where Medicare and Medicaid have failed us. I would like to know that. Now, people often say, well, I'll tell you it, what's wrong with it. It's going broke. It is going broke. Just like us. Why is it going broke? Whose fault is that? 
Who has the guts to take on cost? Nobody. Nobody's ever had the guts to take on cost. Bush, you know, talk about anti-capitalism, anti-American uh, policies. You know, when when you are the largest consumer of a product in a capitalist society, you negotiate yourself a good deal. Bush made it illegal to negotiate with the pharmaceuticals. Obama, same thing. That's a disgrace. That is a failure to lead. But as far as Medicare and Medicaid, some of the most fervent protesters at these town hall meetings are people saying, you know, one of two things. Don't, don't alter my Medicare. Don't mess with my Medicare. Or we don't want government-run insurance competing with private industry and driving them out of business. Now, when it comes to Medicare and the people who want to preserve it, why? I mean, it is the purest form of socialized medicine. Why are we not having that argument? Why isn't somebody saying, I've seen a few people say it, I, I, to be fair, I have. Uh, why are more people saying it? If you don't like socialized medicine, renounce Medicare. And for God's sakes, if you're using Medicare, stop. You're not a socialist. You're a capitalist. Just on principle, stop using Medicare. I don't think I'm going to have many takers on that one. The other issue I hear is that government-run health care is going to drive private industry out of business. Well, how are they going to do that if they're so poorly run? How is government run anything going to perform better in the marketplace than private industry? Isn't that what, isn't that the argument? Government can't do anything and therefore the government shouldn't? How is it something as incompetent as government run health care could have a chance against the privately run health care? It makes no sense. But it is scary, and that's what they're after. Big government. I mean, if you can find somebody willing to repeal Medicare, I want that name. Email me, call me with the name of the elected congressman or woman or senator who is advocating repeal of Medicare. Then I'll believe you. Then I'll believe those people who say they're against socialized medicine. Show me one person in elected office, in a national elected office, that shares your view. How can that have no support out of 535 members of Congress? Because it's not a real issue. It's an illusion. It's fear. It isn't real. In the meantime, with each passing day and each passing month, more and more Americans make tough choices on health care. I have a client who spends $500 a month on prescription drugs. 500 a month. You don't have to scare her. She's already scared. So who are you scaring? The people who already have what they want? In order to scare them, you got to somehow convince them that the government will be taking away what they already have that has not been proposed. My client, she's terrified. She has a real fear. She can't afford her own health. She wants change. She wants something available to her. 
It's amazing what we treat as rights in this country and what we don't treat as rights. The protester has a right to his or her handgun, but you don't have a right to your own health. I don't know about that one. And I recognize the right to own the gun, by the way. I own a gun. I've owned many. But the health care issue is an issue that affects Americans. And I'm not just talking about the millions of uninsured. I mean, those people are desperate for some help. They're already scared. You can't scare them about socialized medicine because any medicine is better than what they have, which is nothing. The only people you can really scare are the people who have something already. And you never tell them that things are optional. You tell them they're going to lose something. That's American politics. You don't tell people what they stand to gain. You tell them what they stand to lose. And you make it a near certainty that they will. That's how you win elections. You tell people who to be afraid of and who to blame. In the meantime, you haven't solved a single problem. Can you imagine a you defended debate on the issue of health care reform? Would anybody be qualified to participate? Who? What would they say? This is what's in the bill. You can be sure that if we put on a view defendant debate on that issue, we would know what's in the bill. And we would make people defend every assertion. Death panels? Where? Show me the language. Don't say it again. Move on. That's about how that conversation would go. If you can't defend it, don't say it. If you are really conjuring up images of a panel of, of, of individuals, like a panel of judges almost, who will determine who lives and who dies, then you better be able to prove it. you got to be able to prove that one. Particularly when you're bringing within the scope of that retarded children and the elderly which is what I believe uh, Sarah Palin did. Defend it. Show me the language. And if you can't, you should be run out of town on a rail for scaring people over something as incredibly sensitive and serious as that. And as a public, we shouldn't tolerate it. The president should be met and bested on the field of reason. I know this sounds a little, I don't know, a little grand on my part, but I don't know of anybody else who's offering it. Where is the field of reason? Right now, I submit it does not exist. We filmed a pilot at SUNY Binghamton that was one hour of pure substance. No spin, no talking points, nothing but facts and real arguments from qualified people. The audience left there going, I didn't know that the right of privacy wasn't in the Constitution. That point was agreed upon by both debaters. I had no idea a school district had that kind of authority when it comes to its curriculum. You know, that those are substantive issues. It was a, a debate that was memorable 
because it did not contain a single memorable line. It was two sincere advocates, completely qualified, who followed our rules and gave factual answers that they could back up with the Constitution. The issue was the role of a Supreme Court justice, and they cited the Constitution in every answer. People who went there got what they came for, which was some information, some help understanding the issues. All right, that's going to do it for this week. I will be back live next week, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening to You Defend It, and I'll see you next week.